Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with David Freed of YM Research. We're going to talk today about some of the new transistor structures that are coming out at the most advanced process nodes. David, as the foundries move down to 3 nanometers and beyond, they're starting to come up with new transistor structures. The first one, of course, is nanosheets. We've been hearing about that as a gate all around type of uh, transistor for quite some time. But there's uh, some other ones on the horizon too, CFETs, uh, also uh, fork sheet FETs. What's the reality of this stuff actually coming to market? And what sort of problems do you foresee? Um, it looks like nanosheet is going to get there, right? Uh, I think people have been working on nanowire and nanosheet for quite some time. And you're starting to see some pretty significant results. Um, I have pretty high confidence that nano sheet technology will go to manufacturing relatively soon in several different uh, technology nodes across the world. I think beyond that, the future is, is pretty fuzzy. I think nano sheets are going to be a pretty big change and a pretty uh, large set of innovation to accomplish. And so they had better be extendable through a few technology nodes to justify that uh, complexity and that investment. I do think there's pretty significant room to run on nanosheets that we'll see that for a considerable stretch of time uh, in different technology nodes. Let's take a closer look. Sure. What are we looking at here? Okay, so this is a relatively standard cross-section that I think we've seen a lot of examples of nanosheets uh, in current literature and current technology. Um, just a few pieces to get ourselves oriented. Uh, at the bottom, again, this is a cross-section, so this is the substrate of the chip or of the bottom of the transistor. Uh, the reason it's called a nano sheet is because it typically is an oblong cross section. So this is going into and out of my drawing here. Um, and in most of the sections we've seen, there's about three, maybe more, maybe less, three of these sheets stacked on top of each other. And those are the nano sheets. The gate of the transistor wraps around all of these sheets. And then the source and the drain are into and out of this cross section. So that's the other dimension. And there's a lot of complexity in that dimension as well. We've seen as we get down to each new uh, transistor type, so FinFETs, for example, it works great in, for a while in terms of controlling the leakage. Then the dimensions become so small that it doesn't work anymore. Is the same going to happen with nanosheets? Um, so planar FETs, the gate used to control the channel from one side. In FinFETs, the gate controlled the channel basically from two to three sides of the, of the device. Nano sheet or nano wire, it's called a gate all around. The gate controls the channel from all around. And so you, you can't really get more, more around the channel. This is pretty much optimal structure. Uh, that being said, you will run out of density scaling until you can keep stacking these on top of one another. And so um, from a density scaling perspective, there are, there's room to go and there's requirements to go there. The other challenge from a density and a control perspective is in the other dimension, okay? From, from source to drain to source to drain in the dimension in and out of the board and also to adjacent devices laterally. And so there's significant scaling challenges to this structure as you go forward. Uh, you mentioned earlier the fork sheet device. The fork sheet is really an attempt to optimize or to improve the density scaling in the horizontal direction between devices. However, the dimensions here are much tighter than they were in the past, so everything has to be perfect, right? You need your films to hit, uh, hit on all sides. You need to be able to make sure that you've got everything measured precisely, right? Yeah, so the dimensions are tiny, and one of the biggest challenges here is the requirements to meet those dimensional specs are in directions and locations that we haven't really had to worry about for uh, previous technologies. The example is when you're depositing your gate dielectric or your gate metal, um, and, and the dielectric I've shown here in blue, you know, between the gate metal and the nano sheets, you're required to hit specifications underneath suspended structure here. We really haven't had to worry about that too much in device integration yet. And so there's some pretty significant challenges meeting, as you said, very, very tight dimensions, very tight spec and variability requirements, but also doing it in three dimensions in locations of the device we've never had to worry about. One of the really interesting aspects here, it's not just um, 
doing the etches, doing the depositions, doing the cleans, doing all the different processes to create this device, it's also in the measurement of those devices. Um, trying to measure the thickness of this dielectric film um, underneath individual nano sheets, it's going to require some really innovative metrology techniques to get that right. You also need to take that data and be able to say, this is important, this is not, this is a latent defect, this doesn't matter, right? Uh, absolutely. And as we've discussed in previous uh, interviews, some of these defects are yield killers, right? But some of these defects won't kill yield, they'll just alter performance or reliability long term. And so the ability to measure, check, and test this device, all the different processes, the different materials, at those tight dimensions in these strange geometries and be able to parse what's a problem and what's not, uh, it's getting much more difficult. In the past when you did metrology and inspection and test, you typically took a portion of whatever you were producing and you went through and said, okay, it, does this look good? If it's good, everything else will be fine. The dimensions here are so tight now that you can't do that anymore, right? Now you have to do a much higher percentage. Some of the, if you think about automotive, they're looking for what, 100% inspection on some of this stuff. Yeah, so not only do you have to inspect more and measure more, um, the tolerances are so tight. We're talking about atomic scale tolerances. And so the only way we're really going to be able to meet these on individual process level, but also on an integrated level, is by combining really a massive additional set of data uh, in order to screen, measure, understand the dimensions, but also control the processes and the integration. Um, and so, as you said, it used to be maybe a metrology step or an inspection step. Now we're taking data from, from metrology, advanced metrology, hybrid metrology, multiple different inspections, uh, different types of inspection, but also we're really beginning to harvest the data coming off the process tools themselves, uh, time series, sensor data that are evolving during the process themselves and in situ measurement and metrology within those process tools. We're finding that we really have to combine all of that data in order to provide the most, the highest levels of advanced process control and, and real-time control of these processes, uh, both you know, feed forward feedback, but also real-time control during the process. Do you have to use machine learning AI to analyze some of that stuff? Absolutely. So. Um, there is an evolving field of how to manage that data. Um, even just harvesting the right data, having it in the right formats and the right standards, and joining that data properly is pretty complicated. Um, there's so many parameters we're looking at. The dimensionality of these problems is extremely high. And so we can do some advanced analysis and we can apply some analytical techniques to that, that data set. Uh, but really, if we're going to if we're going to get the last bit of optimization and control, we're going to be using machine learning and AI techniques on those massive data sets to identify these trends, these control parameters, and, and to control that system in real time, because the data volume and the data complexity is getting really high. Computation's always been part of this process, but does this now become a huge challenge in terms of this is... It's not just the process anymore, it's now, what do we do with the data? How do we collect all this? And is the data accurate? Absolutely, and, and fabs worldwide are digesting that challenge and actually taking that challenge on, you know, head on. So um, a lot of the individual process optimization can be done on the process tools, uh, fleet management of multiple process tools in the same fab, or multi-process integration optimization can be done sometimes um, at the tool level, sometimes in the fab at a fleet or server level, sometimes at the fab level um, at the host control level. So there's multiple different layers of compute that are going to be needed to do these types of optimization. Uh, for me, I think it's kind of nice because we're making computer chips and memory chips in the fab and now we're applying them and using them to create the next generation. It's really a virtuous cycle. We've got new materials coming in here as well. You mentioned some of the new dielectrics, but there's also things like ruthenium and basically a, a bunch of elements that weren't even a part of the uh, uh, manufacturing process in the past. How does that factor in here? Um, absolutely. So I think the, the key thing is anytime you have a new material in the fab, uh, there's how do we deposit it? Uh, how do we check that we haven't contaminated other tools? How do, we, how do we remove it? How do we clean it? And how do we measure it? Um, so each one of those can result in a completely new technology from process technology, from metrology, but also the data analysis. 
Um, the different types of measurement in metrology lend themselves to different data, different data types, and incorporating that in that compute, uh, computational scheme to control the process is more complicated. Every new element adds several new uh, orders of dimensionality to the complexity of this problem. So as you're getting into the uh, nano sheets and the um, fork sheet FETs, do they now need new, new materials, and if so, for what? Um, I think those are slightly orthogonal axes, you know, fork sheet, nano sheet. Those are really structural innovation. Um, I think those are going to come along with material innovation. They may or may not be, uh, you know, in the front end versus the back end where we're seeing a significant amount of material innovation. Uh, but I think, I think they'll come along together. Um, one thing I'll say is as the structures become more and more complicated, we're seeing the use of different materials in order to differentiate structure. So to provide selectivity between multiple different materials, you often need an additional material to, to add to that selectivity. And so just the structural constraints alone are driving material innovation. But we're, we're used to thinking about this in terms of electrostatic effects and things like that, thermal. Now what we're dealing with is potentially mechanical effects too, right? Uh, yeah, and, and again, we've always been dealing with mechanical effects. They just get more complicated to deal with in, in these strange architectures and strange structures. Um, you know, again, with planar FETs, we didn't have to worry about the substrate leaning and flopping and bending. And in fin, fin FETs, we started to have to learn that problem. Now in nano sheets, we have to worry about the structural integrity of these thin suspended sheets, especially in the processes where they are suspended uh, prior to being sort of locked in by other materials around them. And so, yeah, there's all sorts of geometric stress um, and mechanical effects that really need to be well understood here. Some of them are very, very local, like in an individual transistor. Some of them are more regional or global across the wafer as we're using these advanced structures and com complicated uh, stacks. We're generating large stresses, we're warping parts of, the, parts of the chip or even parts of the wafer or the wafer itself with all these different stresses and mechanical effects. David Freed, as always, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks, Ed. I enjoyed it.